So what happens when you eat too many marijuana brownies? Oh man. Highness. You get a pot belly. Oh. Oh. So in the beginning, Adam and Eve, you talked about this in your speech, Adam and Eve were in Eden. And they were told one rule, do not eat the forbidden fruit. You can do anything else you want. You can run around for eternity. Do not eat the forbidden fruit. Only one rule. Well, they had all of eternity to break it. So they got around to doing it. And once they did, they felt ashamed. And at the time, the serpent had to work at it. He said, go ahead and eat that fruit. That will make you smart. It will make you like a god. And at first, Adam said, no, 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 I'm not going to do it. I'm going to, I'm going to pay attention to God. But the serpent kept whispering, no, go ahead and do it. God just doesn't want you to be like him. And he said, no, no, I'm not going to do it. And then Eve showed up. And of course, Eve is naked. They both were naked. And it's really hard when a naked woman keeps dangling the forbidden fruit in front of you. And eventually he broke down and said, oh, okay, all right, all right. I'll eat the forbidden fruit. And of course, God immediately knew that they had eaten the forbidden fruit because they felt ashamed and they had to put clothes back on. And God said, what are you wearing clothes now for? You know you did wrong, don't you? And what was the result? The result was Adam got thrown out of Eden and had to work for a living. And Eve got thrown out of Eden and had pain in childbirth. And the serpent got to be smashed on his head throughout the rest of his existence by a man who hated him in order to pay him back for his evil whispering. Now what does this have to do with Proposition 64. Proposition 64 has another forbidden fruit. And the forbidden fruit that they're offering you is pleasure without consequences. They're trying to insinuate that you can go smoke a marijuana joint and it'll never affect you. In order to make it more prevalent, prevalent they want to legalize it. Well, what are some of the repercussions for legalizing marijuana? I've brought some studies which I'll go ahead and pass around. This first study talks about PME, prenatal marijuana exposure. And unfortunately, of the 1,340 women who were in this study, 30% of them had used marijuana in the first trimester. 30%! This is before we try and legalize it. Imagine how, much, how many people are going to use it after it gets legalized. And so they did studies of what happens to these poor kids who are exposed to this. And let me go ahead and read this. At age 10, there were significant associations between PME, prenatal marijuana exposure, and attention, hyperactivity, and impulsivity, and memory deficits on the design, memory, and screen score of this test. At age 10, exposed offspring also had significantly higher rates of depression and anxiety, at age 14, these kids who had been exposed, these adolescents with pre-marijuana exposure, did less well on the coding, block designs, and mazes tests. So they did a regression analysis of these children, of these 1,340 women, over the course of 14 years, and found out their side effects associated with marijuana use by these mothers during the first trimester. Imagine that. These kids suffered. They suffered for the sins of the parents. Here's a second study that I've talked about before. This isn't the first time I've come before you to talk about how marijuana is bad for you. This study I've talked about before was done by Madeline Meyer, and it was a study done over 38 years in Australia. They used thousands and thousands of people in the study. And it shows what they did is over the course of 34 years, they measured these people on four different occasions. And for those who were using marijuana more than uh, three times a week, that was considered use of marijuana. And at the four times that they took the test, if you were using it, they did a correlation between your IQ since the time you were born and your IQ over that period of time. And what they showed is that the users who were diagnosed at one of those tests lost about two IQ points. During two of those testing periods, if they were diagnosed as being users, they lost an average of three points. And if they were tested three times over that period of time, and they were 
diagnosed have been using <laughs> marijuana, they would lose up to six points of IQ. Up to six points of IQ for those who are using it over a 20 year period of time. Pretty significant. Now, most of us don't have extra IQ points to lose. And I count myself amongst them. Why would you intentionally go out and self-destruct for some pleasure? Because the serpent is whispering in your ear that there won't be any consequences. Well, let's look at some more consequences. What is IQ associated with? On my next graph, I show that those with high IQs make more money. We all want to make more money, don't we? Here's the IQ of people in the low part. Here's the IQ of people in the high part. This is a pretty easy graph that's associated both with net worth and with your average monthly income. As you can see, the smarter you are, the more money you make. Now, 80% of IQ is what you're born with, and 20% can be hurt or helped by education. They've shown that mothers who actually breastfeed their children can help increase their IQs. If they're actually putting on classical music, that can help your IQs. Getting educated can help your IQs. So a lot of it you are born with, but a good portion of it can be affected by poor decisions that are made by your parents. I'll go ahead and pass this around. I'll go ahead and pass this around. And we're not done yet. We've got some more. In Washington, everybody knows Washington State? They legalized pot in Washington State. Here's a graph which I will pass around. Fatal road crashes involving marijuana double after state legalizes the drug. 2010, they legalize it. Oh, and you can see that little hockey stick start shooting up. When you're high, you die. Get in car wrecks, you kill your loved ones, you kill yourselves. Pass this around, please. Now, there's this myth that there aren't going to be a lot of people who die from marijuana. They try and actually say that it's safer than people who use alcohol. So I went to find a very good example of how that's completely false. That was one that I just passed around how car accidents have doubled. Here's another one. And this has a little neat graphic that comes with it. In New Zealand, one of the pilots for these hot air balloons was high on marijuana. He's a hot air balloon. So he's a hot air balloon pilot, yes. I don't know why that's funny, but well, I guess hot air balloons go high. Yes, that's, I'm getting to that. You, you, are, you are smart. So, so he's flying around and he doesn't see the electrical lines. So this is the hot air balloon being fried. Now once it's fried, a lot of hot air way up into the atmosphere, while the basket is on fire, and then they all go plummeting to their death. So there'll be those who tell you there's no such thing as people dying on marijuana, but the 11 people who died on this hot air balloon and all the families that are suffering will tell you otherwise. They know that that's the serpent. Mm. So what happens when you get high? Well, first, you lie about it, show up to work, and say you're fine. Then you start crying as you get closer to the electrical line. Mm. Then you end up getting fried. Then you die, and then you burn. Mm. You get high, you lie, you cry, you die, and you burn. Burn! Not a pleasant way to go, is it? Mm. Now I look around here. And I see a narrative playing out, not just on this issue, but across America. And the narrative is very easy. There are those who live for pleasure. They're like animals. They go from one pleasure to the next. They pay attention to the serpent. And the serpent says, there are no consequences for illicit pleasure, immediate pleasure, any pleasure. And they have paid attention to the serpent, and they take the forbidden fruit. And there are others who live a different life, who reject 
the forbidden fruit. Who wants something greater? They want to be all they can be. It's not just a slogan. It's not just a bumper sticker. It's not just a recruitment poster. It is a way to live your life where you stand for something. You stand for principle. You stand for conviction. You have a, a meaning in your life that is higher than just being an animal that meanders from one pleasure to the next. There is a lie that the serpent is telling us. It's called YOLO. You only live once. I have no problem with having some pleasure every now and then, but the cool concept of YOLO is that you have to cram as much pleasure as possible into your life because you don't have an afterlife, and you might as well have it now. But for those of us who are Jewish or Catholic, we know that we do have an afterlife, that there is something better, that we came from the Garden of Eden and we have a chance in the next life to go back. And how we make our decisions in this life will determine where we are in the afterlife. If we are standing, if we are sitting, or if we are crawling. But whether you believe in an afterlife or not, I have shown that there are consequences in this life for the decisions that we make. And when I look out at this audience, I see a group of people who want something more who want to live a meaningful life, who want to build up this civilization, build up the rules that make us a strong community instead of tearing them down. I see people who want to be all they can be, all that they deserve to be. You know, every night I go to bed, and I say the Lord's Prayer. And the last two lines of the Lord's Prayer are, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us from this evil of Proposition 64. Deliver us from this evil of the serpent whispering in our ear and telling us that we can have pleasure without consequences. And embrace your better and higher selves. Mr. Tilsman. Mm -hmm. Please take a minute to write down.